Greetings. Well, today I want to speak about one of the thorniest issues in the Christian life. And it is characterized uh, by a slogan that uh, I am sure you all have heard, that we are, to, as Christians, to be in the world, but not of it. And one of the reasons that this is such a thorny issue is the various ways, uh, different ways, that uh, Christian groups respond to this slogan. It seems to me that Christians either respond with total separation and isolation, that is to say they have nothing to do with anyone who is not part of their uh, church group or church denomination, and oftentimes they are even uh, isolated from other Christians that do not see uh, their mission as uh, they see it. Or on the other hand, we have people who compromise uh, with the world um, by adopting worldly values and worldly practices because, well, for multiple reasons, but primarily they want to be liked and they want to be accepted by the world. And so much so that they uh, risk, if not achieve, <clears throat> losing their Christian distinctiveness and their witness. And some compromise to such an, an extent uh, that they're no longer part of the kingdom at all. Now, from a biblical perspective, neither extreme hits the mark because extremes seldom hit the mark. Total isolation ignores Jesus' prayer for unity that we looked at last week in our text, John uh, chapter 17. And so they are isolated from other believers, which does not square with Jesus' prayer. Well, the, those folks that compromise ignores Jesus' prayer that we would be sanctified by God's word, that we would follow his truth found in the scriptures, not human reasoning. So I want to look very carefully at our text today to look at the words and the phrases, the perceptions that Jesus actually is praying. Jesus doesn't want us to be separated from the world or isolated from each other, nor does he want us to be of the world by compromising with the world. So I've characterized our issues this morning with three questions. How can we live out Jesus' will for us as his disciples? How can we be in the world but not of it? And how can we be faithful uh, to achieve Jesus' mission for us? Well, first I would assume that all believers would agree what Jesus' goal is as he states it in the first verse of our text, verse 13 of uh, chapter 17. He's praying to his father moments before he's arrested, and here's what he says, verse 13. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they, followers of his, you and me, disciples, that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Now, it should be accepted and understood that Jesus is praying to his Father in heaven in anticipation of his impending arrest and his death the following day on the cross. And verse 1 of that chapter 17 makes clear that Jesus is praying this entire prayer, the whole chapter 17 of John's gospel, with the um, in the context of his anticipation of completion of his ultimate purpose for coming to earth, why God sent him uh, to earth, and that is uh, his going to the cross, of course. Jesus prays in verse 1, Father, the time has come. And as I thought about that, and as you read the gospel record, 
Time is always a factor in Jesus' thinking and in his conduct. Think of the first miracle he did in uh, public. You will find a version of it in chapter 2 of John's Gospel. It's called the Wedding Feast at the city of Cana. They were having a traditional Jewish wedding. They ran out of wine, and Jesus' mother, it's speculation, but it had something to do with the refreshments or the um, uh, reception for the family uh, after the wedding, uh, or I guess during the wedding. But anyway, they ran out of wine. She goes to Jesus. And uh, he's there as a guest. He's not a part of the wedding. And he says to his mom, my time has not come. And yet he did change the water into wine because he's always going to do what mama wants him to do. <laughs> well, what about later in uh, the gospel record we find his family, mostly his brothers and sisters, suggesting that he should go to Jerusalem where he could be seen and heard because in Jerusalem that's where the religious leaders were, that's where decisions were made uh, about religious teachings and uh, basically, they wanted him to get out of Galilee and go to Jerusalem. But he said to them, my time is not yet. You see, Jesus had a very specific mission to fulfill. He had people to engage with, and he had Old Testament prophecies to fulfill. And his mission was always governed by time. It seems to me that we, even in the 21st century, and especially in the 21st century, with what's going on in the world in our country today, need to have a sensitivity to time, understand the urgency of time. Because every day, people who we know or have a relationship with are going into eternity without a relationship with God. And Jesus understood the urgency of time. He says in verse 4 of chapter 17, I have brought you glory, speaking to his father, by completing the work you gave me to do. Well, that's how we bring glory to God, by doing what he's asked us to do, to complete our mission that he's asked us to complete. So with his mission almost finished, Jesus is now focusing on those that he's going to leave behind here on earth. And his goal is stated in that verse 13, the first verse of our text, that they, you and me, may have the full measure of my joy within them. Now I want you to stop and think about that for a moment. Jesus is about to be arrested He's going to be beaten and tortured, mocked and humiliated. He's going to be executed by one of the most painful uh, means of execution that humanity has ever invented. And on top of all of that, he's going to take on himself your sin and my sin. Indeed, the sins of every human being that ever lived on the earth. He's going to pay the price for those sins. And therefore, because he does take that sin upon himself, he is going to experience separation from his father for the first time in all of eternity. And his concern is that we might have his joy. I can't imagine any clear demonstration of selfless love for us by Jesus other than the fact that he did go to the cross for us. I want you to think about that the next time you hear that biblical uh, exhortation that believers are to be like Jesus, Romans 8, 29, that we are to love others as ourselves. So I want us to consider something as we seek to answer these three questions that I posed. How can we live out Jesus' will? How can we be in the world but not of it? And how can we be faithful uh, to complete Jesus' mission for us? I think perhaps we need to look at that slogan, be in the world but not of it. Quite frankly, I think 
uh, that we need to change its focus. Obviously, the teaching comes from these verses in our text, John's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 13 through 19. And we are in the world, obviously. But the thrust of that slogan appears to be that we not be of the world. Not being of the world seems to be the focus, our mission. Make sure that doesn't happen because that means we're compromising with the world and that is a serious issue. But can I suggest to you that that is not quite the uh, emphasis that Jesus is praying about. It puts the emphasis on the wrong mission, not being of the world. If that is our mission, then we are to be moving away from the world. It's no wonder that some Christians seek to be separated from the world to the point of isolation. But that isolation brings them to the point where they're just talking to themselves. They're not engaging our culture or those who are not part of their group uh, that live around them. They don't engage with the world. They actually oftentimes end up judging the world and feeling, um, I should, holier than thou, self-righteous. And that in and of itself presents another problem and a sin that needs to be overcome. So it's not what Jesus is praying about. Jesus, in fact, said he came into the world to save sinners, that he came to serve, not to be served. The world hated believers for accepting the words of Jesus. He says that in verse 14 of our text, that he gave the world the world, the words that his father gave him to share with the world. And because believers accept his word, they hate, the world hates believers. Well, when you accept the word of God and you come into relationship with him based on what he teaches us in his word, you are no longer part of the world at that point. That engenders hostility from the world. Well, Jesus wasn't part of the world either, but he engaged with the world. You know, Jesus taught from the very beginning of his public ministry that believers would be persecuted uh, for, for accepting the message that he brought, the words that his father gave him to share. Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount? I like to go back to that passage in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. <clears throat> but as he begins that sermon in Matthew 5, remember how it starts? With the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor of spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are merciful, and blessed are those who are uh, peacemakers. There are several others. Those are qualities of what it means to be a citizen of God's kingdom, Christ's kingdom. To be a Christian, we call it, in the 21st century. Well, where does that get you? Jesus answers that question in Matthew chapter 5 with his last beatitude in verses 11 and 12. He says, blessed are you when people insult you. Ha, huh. that's what it's going to get you. Insult you, persecute you, and falsely, now that's a key word, falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me, not because you deserved it, but because of your Christian witness. Jesus says, rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, not this earth. Here we find struggle, persecution, ridicule, hostility, but be glad because of your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they, meaning the world, persecuted the prophets who were before you. So Jesus is very clear from the beginning that his followers are not of the world. But he never said that we are to withdraw from the world. 
quite the opposite. In verse 15, he prays to his father by saying, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. That is our mission, not being taken out of the world, but that you protect them by the power of your name, God's nature, God's power, that we, the followers of Jesus, God's family, would be protected from the evil one. You see, the evil one is Satan, and he is in the world. He is certainly of it because the Bible says <clears throat> he's the prince of this world. So what are we missing here? Can I suggest to you, based on Jesus' prayer, the words that he used, that not being of the world is not our destination. It's not our mission. It's our starting point. It's where we begin to fulfill the mission Jesus has for us. It's not the end game. It's the starting point. Jesus is saying that believers are not of this world, and he's not of this world. That's the starting point. We are sanctified by his word, the Bible, the scriptures. That sets us apart because it's God's truth. That's what governs our message, and our own lives. So where are we going then? Jesus says, into the world, because Jesus came to go into the world. Why? Because that's his mission for us, to make new disciples, to share his message of love and forgiveness and reconciliation with him. In verse 18, Jesus prays, you sent me into the world, I have sent them, you and me, into the world. Separa separation and isolation from the world is the exact opposite of what Jesus wants for us. He wants us to engage with the world, demonstrate to the world what it means to be his disciple, to be part of his family, no matter what it costs, because it costs him his life, we are to give up our lives to serve him. But we're sanctified, set apart by his word, the message, his truth. So Jesus starts out with believers not being of this world, but he moves to believers being sent into the world, just as he was sent into the world. But we are protected from the evil one. He seeks to make us part of the world through compromise. If we compromise, we lose our integrity, we lose our witness, we lose our effectiveness. Do you get the, uh, the distinction? True followers of Jesus Christ have been crucified to the values and the thinking of the world. But we have been raised to a new life as a new creature, a new creation. And we have been sent back into the world to rescue others. We've been sanctified, as I said, by God's word, his truth. Protected by the power of the name, the nature of God. His power protects us. And we're sent back into a dark world with the light of his word to rescue others from the darkness of Satan's lies and deceptions. We're not of this world. We're just sent into it. That's Jesus' mission for us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word and for your love and for this passage in John that teaches us uh, as we listen to Jesus pray to you just before he's arrested and goes through that horrible ordeal uh, on the cross. It gives us an insight deep into his heart and his commitment to us and his uh, commission to us of a mission just as you gave him his purpose and mission. He has given us ours. Thank you for these words. Help us fulfill them 
In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week and happy Father's Day.